we are going to talk this morning about fishing holes. Now, this is a tough sermon for me to preach because I don't like to fish. However, given the subtitle of the sermon, maybe that's not a bad thing. Um, I am not a fisherman. Uh, some of you are. Well, some of you, yeah, some of you are fishermen. Some of you just like to fish. Um, I am neither. That being said, I have been fishing, and I have uh, uh, sat and listened to the fishermen tell their stories. And as I was thinking last week about the upcoming sermon, I mentioned to Nancy, I said, I think I've got something that kind of came to me. I said, it's to do with fishing. The Bible says a lot about fishing. Eli just read to us a scripture in which uh, Jesus tells fishermen how to fish. He tells the fishermen what to do. And when you think about it, uh, what was Jesus' job? Jesus was a carpenter. He's not a fisherman. And it's kind of, you know, if he's not the Lord, it's very presumptuous for him to come up and tell them what to do in that moment. Um, you know, you, 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 wouldn't, you wouldn't catch me stopping by a construction site and telling people how to build a building because I'm not a builder. I don't, know, I don't know how to do that. But Jesus is the Lord. And that's a positive uh, uh, aspect of fishing. And in fact, there's a lot of ways. If you were going to preach a sermon called Fishing Holes, there's a lot of different ways you could take that sermon. Um, you could talk about people maybe who choose to be out at the lake instead of at the services of the Lord's Church, for instance. You could talk about that. You could talk about... Um, the idea You could take this from the perspective of evangelism. Jesus tells them to let down their nets. They bring it up, and he says, I'm going to make you fishers of men, right? And you could talk about that in personal evangelism. All those would be applicable. But what we want to talk about this morning is the devil, he likes to fish. Uh, Alan Webster wrote a track some years ago called The Devil Likes to Fish in Troubled Waters. I suggest that track to you. We're not going to base our sermon off of it, but it is a good track. And, and it probably is what brought this to my mind, that, that tracked title and that tracked information. But we're going to start out with the devil's fishing holes. We only have three points uh, this morning, and yet those three points, I think, are something that can draw our minds to the nature of our relationship to the devil. I want to start by pointing out the picture that's on the screen. Um, I am not a fisherman. If I were going to be a fisherman, I would not be that guy. I think I'd be sitting in one of those nice bass boats or something. Um, but I want you to notice something about that guy. He's standing there in that lake, right? And he's hoping to pull fish out of that lake. I think from the very outset, what we must understand is this. When you see a man or a woman fishing... There are at least two participants, right? Hopefully. You have the human being who is holding the fishing rod, and you have the fish who may or may not get caught in that trap. When you see that situation, you know in that relationship role who the greater party is. You know who the dominant one is in that and the first thing we need to understand is the devil is more powerful than we are. If you think, I'll, I'll just play games and skirt around sin, you're trying to play with the devil. It will not turn out well for you. He is stronger than you are. He's not stronger than God is, but he is stronger than you are. I make this point a lot because um, I think it's something that, that gets left out a lot. And so I'm going to say it one more time. When Moses died and the archangel is there, and Michael the archangel is there, and he is going to take care of the body of Moses, the devil shows up. And he would not rail against the devil but rather said, the Lord rebuke you. That's not respect, because there's no reason to respect the devil. But it is a realization of the station and the power of the devil. Even an archangel, who is far more powerful than, than, than all of us combined, even an archangel of God 
wouldn't bring accusation against the devil, but said what? God rebuke you. So we got to start out with that mindset. He is the fisherman. We are the fish. And I don't know if I, it was on the screen, but I don't know if I pointed out that our keywords are fish and devil. So if you got a young one, you can write that down for them. I think they've already scored several uh, marks there uh, already. So our first point is that fishing requires deception, and the devil is the father of it. And you know that fishing requires deception. Now, I'll say this. The type of deception necessary for fishing is not the same as some of you that hunt. Because I'll, I'll never forget one of the first times my friend invited me to go hunting with him for deer. He wanted to put um, deer urine on me. And I was like, look, I'm all about tricking these deer up to a point. I'm not going to rub deer urine on me to try to kill a deer. Deception, though, has different forms. And you know this. A hunter knows this. You're, you're trying to deceive the animal into thinking it's alone and it's safe. A, a fisherman knows this. You've got to deceive that fish into believing it's about to receive something good, even though you know that you're going to ruin its whole day. It's deception involved. So let's go to Genesis 3. We, we were here last week, so I thought we might just dip in very quickly um, this morning. Genesis chapter 3. He's the father of deception. He knows how to fish. You might use one of those big, long worms, rubber worms. The devil used a good-looking little fruit here in, in, in Genesis chapter 3. Verse 4 reads, then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The devil told the, mostly the truth here, right? He used all the same words God did, but he did what? He, he introduced one extra little word, not. God said, The day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. De the devil said, You shall not surely die. There's an old-timey track I used to see in track racks um, called The Knots in the Devil's Tail. This is one of the knots, N-O-T-S, in the Devil's Tail, T-A-L-E. He's a liar. From the very beginning, he's a liar. I don't know if it's ever, if you ever considered it, but this is the first lie ever told. And until this point, lies didn't exist. And so it makes sense then what Jesus says in John 8, 44. You know, you don't... In John 8, 44, it's a very bold and very powerful statement our Lord makes. But really, it's, it's, it shouldn't be shocking to them. They, they know the Torah. They know that Eve was in the garden and that the first lie ever told was by the devil. But in John 8, 44 reads, You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He is a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, you're seeing a birth. The devil gives birth to the concept of lying. And, and if we're looking at it in the terms of being a fisherman, through his deception, he caught a fish that day. Now, Jesus connects that in John 8 directly with the idea of being a murderer. Well, now that makes sense, though, doesn't it? You ever, you ever gone fishing and you, you actually catch a fish and you pull, you get it out of the water and you lay it there in the deck of the boat? Maybe you got one of those little things where you got to measure the fish to see if you can keep it. 
and it kind of flops around. You know what it's doing on the deck of your boat while it flops around? It has begun the process of dying. Now, I don't like fishing, but I do like deep sea fishing. It's, it's a completely different, completely different thing than lake fishing. But I remember, the, the, I've only ever been deep sea fishing once, but we went out and this guy said, we're going to go right over, and we weren't very far out at all. This was not deep sea fishing. We, we go over to the, where the rocks are and he says, we're going to fish for bait. And we reel these, and as fast as we can reel them in, this dude grabs them and chops their heads off and cuts them up. What did he do? We pulled them out of the water and we killed them. Understand this about the devil and deception. He's a liar with the intent to murder. If you're hungry and you're going fishing because you're hungry, then you are going fishing with the intent to kill what you catch. That is exactly the devil's intent. You have people that romanticize the devil as the fun team. Ain't nothing fun about it. He has no intention of you actually getting anything good. I, I was, when I was doing the research for this, I read that the best uh, bait for catfish is fresh, it's kind of gross, but fresh chicken livers. You have a different set of connections than I do if you can get your hands on fresh chicken livers. But that's what you're supposed to use. Now, you go, cat, you go fishing for catfish, and you put that liver, that chicken liver, onto the line, and you throw it in there. Is that something that is pleasant to the catfish? Does he get something out of it? Yeah, he does. He gets something out of it. He gets a delicious chicken liver. And then he gets jerked up out of the water, gets his head cut off, and gets served on a table. And that is the devil's deal for you. He's a liar. It doesn't mean he doesn't offer anything. It just means that what he offers is not good. Our next point is connected to the first point. But James handles it so perfectly that we, we, we can't not make this point. Fishing requires a lure. And I know some of you fishermen, well, you don't have to have a lure. We just said you can use chicken livers. Okay. For the sake of the point. And by the way, even if you put a chicken liver on there, it's still technically a lure in the, te in the literal sense of the word. It is something to lure in your prey. And so James 1, 13 through 15, is going to speak to this. When we think about lures and fishing, um, you're, you've, have you noticed, I don't, if you are a fisherman, or I mean, you may not be a fisherman, and that's okay, uh, have you noticed that the lure that you... Um, that you set, that it has, oftentimes they have these little parts on them that spin. When I was a kid, I used to blow on that and watch it spin. It's flashy. They got other lures that have various colors in them. If you can get or a serious fisherman, you can get them into some real deep discussions about their favorite lures. You got guys who mourn over the fact that they lose a lure. Um, it, that lure just works so well for me. And you got some guys who are so into it that they can tell you which lure they use in which location, depending on whether they're night fishing, day fishing. And, and, and they, these guys get all caught up in their lures. Fly fish them in the same way with those flies. A lot of them make them themselves. It requires that you be lured in. So in James 1, beginning in verse 13, we see the same principle applies. Um, we're going to start in verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive a crown of life, which the Lord promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. 
but each one is tempted when he is drawn away. Now, some translations translate that word drawn away as lured or lured away, which is exactly what it means. It is the fish swimming through the lake, and it's on the hunt for food, and it sees that little metal flash from your lure as it spins. And that fish, all of a sudden, his attention is caught this direction. And then he notices, now wait a minute, that looks like a minnow. And then he goes in because he's hungry and he wants to eat and he takes that bite. And the devil does the same thing to us. A flash of something shiny, interesting, this will be good for you. And, and, and if he gets your attention with it, you look and then what happens? Well, the, the, the passage lays it out perfectly. First of all, verse 14, each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. If you've got fishermen, like just mortal men and women who fish, if you've got people who go and they, and they enjoy fishing and they know which lure to use for what type of fish, which lure to use in which location, they know exactly how much more so does the devil know exactly what lure to use? He says, oh, it's one of those. I know exactly what to put on here. He's more powerful than me, yes. And he knows what lure to use on me because he knows that I'm drawn away of my own lust. And it's, I'm lured by what I have lust for. And so with that, he can entice me. And he goes on. He says he's, he's drawn away, he's enticed. Now, you're okay. And I love this passage in the light of being a fish and a fisherman's trying to get you. If you're drawn away and enticed by the lure, you're still okay. You're still, you can make it out of this. But then what happens? Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. Well, what's that? That's that tug on the line because you tried to take a bite. That's that stumble, right? But then what? What, and, 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 and I've seen this, uh, the, the couple times I did go fishing as a kid, I remember what I was really good at was jerking the hook out of the fish's mouth. Um, but that comes with being like ADHD, impatient, all that kind of stuff. It's really boring to fish. And so if you then get a bite, you know, you, ah, let me get this. I want to make sure I said it. And I was very good at pulling the hook out of the mouth. And that fish takes that bite, he still got a chance. But then what? Well, he says, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. That means what? That means the devil can sink that hook into you and get you on the line. That is the idea of what we're talking about in 1 John 1-7 when we say that we can walk in the light and have forgiveness, forgiveness of sins. But there's also the, the situation that I can exit the light. I can get hooked by him. I can get pulled in. I can get reeled in by the devil. Thank God for Jesus Christ. Because I can get back out of the devil's boat anytime I want to if I'll turn to him. But it doesn't change the fact that fishing requires a lure. The devil has the lure and the lure that he has. As a matter of fact, he's, he's got a, you see the little tackle box? He's got a tackle box with your name on it. And he's got several lures in there. And he knows which one works, and he knows when they work best, and he knows where they work best. Now, our third point is that fishermen return to productive fishing holes. If you were going to start fishing... And you went out on a lake, and it's hot, and it's sunny, and you sat there all day with a line in the water, and you caught nothing. How many of those trips would it take before you started to lose your interest in fishing? 
And let's say that you did that five, six, seven times. You can't catch anything. And then, and then one time you, you're, you're going by and you cut off in this little area, like you know, a little inlet over here, and you put a line in the water and you pull a fish up. I mean, almost immediately. And you put a line and you, you are having to tell the fish to be patient and hold on a minute and you'll pull them out because they are just lining up for you to pull them out. Now, you catch your limit, and you go home, and you eat fish that night. The next time you go fishing on that same lake, are you going to go back to one of those spots where you sat there with your line in the water all day and caught nothing? Or are you going to go back to that same little inlet where you filled your boat? You know the answer to that question. Even Barry Carter can catch fish if he knows where the fishing hole is. I pick on Barry because he took me fishing one time. And uh, he had a fancy machine and we still couldn't find the fish. Um, fishermen return to productive... They, they, they defend them. They guard them. That's a... That's a uh, a sacred secret to a fisherman is his fishing hole. Do you to understand something? The devil returns to productive fishing holes. And don't get that twisted. It doesn't mean that, that he views you as special. It doesn't mean that you mean anything to him. It simply means this. He knows that he can be successful in this area. There's a couple of ways to look at this. We're going to read some scripture. I just want to point this out, though. You can view this from two different perspectives. The first is in a microcosmic way. That is just me. I can view this with just me. The devil will return to productive fishing holes when it comes to my spiritual walk and my struggle with sin. Talk with people, and quite often you hear frustration with those who struggle with a particular sin or a couple of sins that seem to continually pop up in their lives. And you run into people with those kind of problems sometimes, and they say, I don't know why, I just name the sin, whatever it is, it's like I keep falling into this one. You should not be surprised by that. Sin is not random. I don't, I don't understand this. Do we believe that the devil is real? Do we believe that he's an intelligent being? Do we believe that he understands the nature of the spiritual warfare that's being fought? If all of those things are true and we believe them, why in the world would we be surprised by the fact that the same nagging weakness continually pops up in my life. If there were no intelligent being called the devil, it, it wouldn't make sense. But my friend, the devil understands that in your spiritual walk, there are certain fishing holes that he can return to within you. I need to be careful of those. I need to be aware of those and be careful of those. That's where I've got to build up. You can also view this macrocosmically. Meaning what? I was brand new in the church. I had not, I, I said I was brand new in the church. I was brand new attending service. Maybe I've been attending for maybe eight months, nine months or so. And I'd not obeyed the gospel yet. And I was sitting uh, right over here where the deerings are because that's where I always would sit. You better, in some places, you better be spiritually strong to sit on the second row. Um, a young man came down the aisle. Of course, I'm new to this church. He's a college kid. He comes down the aisle and he sits on the front pew. They talk. He's repenting. He wants to live right. He wants to get right. 
They go up, they announce it, they pray for him. Service ends. People coming up, they're hugging him, they're shaking his hand. I hear two older men, I overhear the comment made. Oh, him again. What's the point of, what's the point of him even being here if he's going to go forward every other Sunday? This is a former gangbanger from Atlanta. I mean, he came out of the streets into the gospel, and he was struggling with that transition. The fact of the matter is, some of us are going to struggle with sin more than others. Some of us are going to struggle with sin more than others, and we're going to be humble, and we're going to ask for prayers. Some of us are going to struggle with sin more than others, and we're just going to hide it better than everybody else so that we don't look like that guy who came forward too many times for that old man's opinion. But the fact of the matter is this. When I'm going, and it can be certain periods in my life. It can be when I've lost a loved one. It can be when I'm feeling lonely. It can be because of a particular temptation to sin. But the devil is going to have greater purchase on me during certain periods of my life. And if I allow myself to have certain weaknesses, and that's just the fact of the matter, there's going to be certain members of the body, especially new Christians, that are going to struggle with sin more. And that is to be expected. You've watched the Nature Channel. You've watched that those lions sit in the grass and they wait and they watch and they wait and they watch. And they're not looking for the biggest, fastest dude out there among those antelope. They're looking for the weak one. They're looking for the injured one. They're looking for the young one. And so they're looking for the one who, frankly, just isn't walking circumspectly, isn't keeping an eye on what's going on, the distracted one. Fishermen return to productive fishing. Let's look at James 4, verse 7. Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. See, now that's the good thing. I don't know this has ever happened among fish, but this is something amazing that we can do. From the perspective of our analogy, it is basically this. If you're a fish and, and there's a fisherman trying to catch you, your only ability to, to get away from him is to swim somewhere else. What's amazing about this is the devil is more powerful than us. The devil is more intelligent than us. And yet, if I resist him, I... Don't get me wrong, the scriptures do see flee fornication. It's not that even I have to run away. He will depart. He'll leave the fishing hole if I resist him. That is a good promise. Now, that being said, we have to take in mind Luke 4.13. This comes just after Jesus' temptation. Um, yes, he will depart. Yes, uh, if, if you flee him, he'll depart. But... Read what Luke uh, 4.13 says. Now when the devil had ended every temptation, this is the temptation of Jesus, he departed from him until an opportune time. Yes, he'll depart, but not forever. He'll come back. He knows right where that fishing hole is. He'll come back and try again next time. Why does he do this? And that's how we're going to close is 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He's doing it for the same reason that many of the people in here like to go fishing. You like to go fishing because you like to eat fish, because you're hungry, because you desire to eat the fish. The devil is fishing in these productive fishing holes because he wants to eat. No, it's not. Obviously, it's not literal, um, but it is, it is figurative, and it is that the case in a spiritual sense. That is what? He wants to devour me. 
But you know, that fishing example is, in some ways, instructive even to the lion example. Because if you think about the way that the lion gets its prey, it goes out and it overpowers its prey and kills it. So, so the analogy in 1 Peter 5, 8, it's a great analogy. Don't get me wrong, all Scripture is from God, all Scripture is wonderful. But it is not a perfect analogy of the interaction between the devil and the sinner. It's telling you his mindset. It's telling you his desire. It's not telling you his approach. If you want to understand his approach, you have to go back to James 1. If you want to understand his approach, you've got to go back to this idea of being a fisherman. The devil, and this is the beauty, this is the good news of the entire sermon, the devil cannot overpower you. We talked about it in Bible class this morning. Paul told the Corinthians, uh, death, where is your sting? Gray, where is your victory? Jesus overcame death. He took the sting away from death. When he died on that cross and shed his blood for your sins, the, the message that was sent forth was the crushing of the head of the devil, such that the devil cannot overpower you. By the power of Jesus and by the strength of his sacrifice, you can overcome the devil. If it's a matter of spiritual strength, you can lean upon the strength of God to overcome him. He can't overpower you. But what he can do, if he wants to devour you, he can't do it by brute force. What he can do, what he must do, is reel you in. Lure you in and set his hook. And make no doubt about it. The intention is to devour. If the message of this strikes home to you and you say, I get that, I see that in my life, then I would suggest something to you. We have at the end of every sermon that we preach, we have what's often called the invitation. It's really not us inviting in any way. It's us exhorting you to accept the Lord's invitation. We are encouraging you to receive the invitation of the Lord. It's always open. This isn't something that's open at the end of a sermon. We simply want to make sure that before we leave, that it's brought up. If, if you are on the devil's line, if you are, to put it in fisherman's term, if you are in that little bucket down there where all these fish that are just sitting there, captive, unable to move, unable to, waiting for uh, the, that death to come, if you're sitting there in the devil's bucket, there is a way out. I need to hear the word of God, Romans 6, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I need to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Therefore, have I told you, you will die in your sin? For if you believe not that I am, you will die in your sin. I need to repent of my sins. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. I need to confess Jesus Christ. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, Romans 10, 10. And I need to be baptized in water for the remission of my sins, Acts 2, 38, where Peter said, uh, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, the devil's powerful. Yes, he's strong. Let me tell you something. If you've never been immersed in water for the remission of your sins, if you'll repent and confess Jesus and go do that right now today, every single time he's ever caught you in your entire life will be wiped out as if it never happened. And every single time he tries to get you again, you'll have the help of God in overcoming him. And, and if that's the position you're in now, you say, I did get out, I did obey, but I've been ensnared again and I want to come home, I want to be free from this sin, we're here for you. We've already, we've already mentioned 1 John 1, verses 7 through 9. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. 
this is the time to do that. If you're online, we have a shepherd on the stream. Uh, Curtis is back there, and you can send him a message letting him know what your spiritual need is. If you're here in person, we leave these front pews open for you. And if you've never come forward before, if you need to, then today is a perfect day to do it. And if you've come forward multiple times before, there is zero shame in coming forward and asking for the prayers of the church as many times as you need to. We are not serving up here as some sort of judge of people who respond to the invitation. We are one of you. God is the judge. And it's God who invites you. So if you have a need, make it known as we stand, as we sing.